So before you sit down, well, I don't want to do this end, though. So, <laughs> you got to pay so, anything? Or? So this is the most stylish panel you'll yes. see. Yeah. <laughs> Until now, Zen and actually where's Carter? Uh, right there. So th they were my models actually. But you guys have tough, you guys have tough competition. Right? So uh, quick introductions. Uh, and I just got to know these gentlemen really over the last 24 hours. I met these two gentlemen last night. Uh, Ansar or Junaid. So his name is Ansar Junaid, but goes by Junaid, so I'm gonna call you Junaid, right? So, just met them, so I have a few notes actually. Pardon my, you know, reading some of this stuff. But, you know, between the three of them, they have created, I think about 15 businesses. Tens of millions in valuation. And, exited many of these businesses to multi-billion dollar corporations. So there is a lot to learn from them. And my personal goal in 45 minutes is to figure out how to be like them when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> so Junaid is the CEO of PwC International, uh, and he'll give you more about that. But it's a 250 million in revenue business with focuses in supply chain, uh, self-storage, hospitality, uh, electronic commerce, uh, if I can call that, right? Uh, uh, stories and stores, and several other areas. So very disparate businesses in some ways, but very successful, uh, all of them. These two gentlemen, you really have to actually go and look at their profiles. So I'll start out with saying this. Fahim is the only person that I know of who knows how to capture an alien while wearing a cowboy hat. <laughs> I, I won't say anything more about that. You have to go look at his TED talk on that topic. Uh, but the two of them are physicians uh, from Ayur Khan, as Khan mentioned. And they are a nephrologist. They are the CEO and partners uh, in uh, Idaho Kidney Institute. They've also founded uh, a nephrology consulting firm based there. Uh, they've also actually been cited by the U.S. Congress and the Senate for their work in Idaho. And, uh, you know, I think with that introduction, we're just going to get started. So I'm going to seat myself here. <laughs> so I think we'll, we, we'll start with uncertainty. <laughs> Uh, you know, we have about 45 minutes. Each one of them can actually tell you a lot in 45 minutes uh, each, but we're going to try to split it and move fast. So tell us a little bit about your story, who you are, not just the business, but who you are, what your background is, how did you get to where you are, and where you go there. Great. Can everybody hear me? Yes. 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 So let me uh, first thanks Harris, um, who was uh, undecided to get me on this panel, because I'm from Cleveland. I, I was rooting for uh, Indians, uh, even, though, even though you guys won. But uh, I wasn't sure if I would have been allowed to, to be here today. You're always allowed. All right, okay. Um, thanks to East West University. Um, thanks to our counselor, Faisal. Um, let me tell you a little bit about my story. So I come from a very humble background from army background. I grew up in Pindi, and uh, I always wanted to go to an Air Force, and uh, I had an accident, uh, and I was flown all over. I had 10 surgeries. I lost a vision in one of my eyes, so I was medically unfit. So I couldn't go to the Air Force. Uh, and the reason I tell you that is this life does not work the way you plan sometimes. So you must be flexible. And I wanted to leave Pakistan, I went to London. Um, wanted to go to London School of Economics, it didn't work out, couldn't afford it. So I tried uh, to go to another school which was affiliated with Arizona State University. Arizona State University had an affiliation in London 
and I uh, applied there, applied to Ohio State, applied to another school called Cleveland State. So Cleveland State was one of the cheapest schools around, so I went to Cleveland State, thinking Arizona is a state, Columbus is a state, and maybe Cleveland is a state. <laughs> so I ended up going to Cleveland State, thinking, and I'm asking everybody, I'm here in Cleveland, and I'm in a state of Cleveland, and it's like, oh, it's a state. <laughs> <laughs> so I went there. Uh, my, first first, well, my first job was at a gyro car, and um, I knew at that time that's not what I was going to do for the rest of my life. So um, there was a river quest going on, and I came up with the idea. I thought, well, I've never cooked, but I'll go and get outsourced kebabs. So I went to this local grocery store, and I ordered some kebabs for the river fest, and I made a little bit of money. And, uh, Actually, $800, I still remember it, and I paid a part of my fee because of that. Um, so I thought, well, maybe I have some common sense, which is not very common. So I said, okay, well, let me um, kind of think about what my passion is. And that's around the time when I graduated, I got married, I was uh, getting a little more responsible. I didn't know what I was going to do. I knew I was then going to be a PhD student. Um, I was always D grade, and but I, I, I knew I always hustled and I was very competitive. I always played sports in army, as you all know. So I, once I got married, I, I got hired by Pepsi. So I worked for a corporate job. I didn't want to be in a corporate job. I went and worked for a packaging company. It's called National Sovereign Corporation. We sort of came our stores in the 90s, where there was no Walmart in the picture, 2,800 stores. I still remember the time when there was no distribution center aspect. And I learned distribution centers aspect because a lot of big box stores were coming up. And you talk about, more on a serious note, about Chicago Mafia. There's Amish Mafia. And in, 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 I don't know if you guys are familiar with Amish Mafia or not, but they work in Homesville County in Ohio and Pennsylvania. So it's, a lot of people talk about luck. I happened to be there, and I knew how to connect the dots, and I was um, passionate about wood, I was passionate about distribution centers when they were coming up, so I started a business. I became a CEO of this company because I got lucky and owner, owner took a liking towards me, but I quit. I talked to my wife. My wife has been the best advisor all along, um, and now my daughter, who is uh, also a great advisor, uh, but where I'm going with that is this, I took a risk. And if you don't take risk in this life, I'm not sure where you're going to be. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of successful successful people, what I believe is, they fail, but they don't stop trying. Uh, and and you got to find your passion. Doesn't matter what you do in your life. I found my passion because I was in packaging, and I connected the dots. And um, I always try to be two steps ahead. And I innovated. Uh, a strategy which I don't know if you know about lawnmowers. We, our company now, 20 years down the line, we've got seven divisions. Uh, we own quite a few hotels, we own a lot of storage places, we've got 20 facilities, we've got thousands of people work for us. Um, and all this experience, what I'm talking about, makes you humble. Um, when somebody always gives you a break. Somebody gave me a break when I became a CEO. Somebody gave me a break when he gave me a job at Jarabar. So when I, when I think about that, uh, the, the only lesson which I can share with you is, is you got to find your passion. I had a burning passion for what I did. Um, I think I was humble enough because I came from a humble background. Um, and I developed leaders. We have 10 different CEOs working for us today. We have positions in Europe, we have positions in Italy, we have positions in China. Um, we got 20 some companies we own. And it's all about creating and developing leaders around you. And you stay humble, you stay behind the scene, and you hope that when you have a failure, you turn it into a some kind of opportunity. So we always did that, and we were successful, and we still try our best to be successful because that's what we believe. Even though I don't have a crystal ball, a lot of people ask us all the time, how are you managing a lot of these companies? And we always tell them, because anytime you lose, anytime uh, you have a failure, you learn from your own mistakes, you turn it into some kind of opportunity. And that's what we do every day.
So I mean, the, the, Nelson Mandela said sometimes, it always seems impossible until it's done. Um, and I read a lot, and I was just at a Cavs game, which, by the way, we are champions, Bulls are not. So please do not. Have a <laughs> Uh, I was just at a stadium, I've got floor uh, seats, somebody gave it to me. Um, and, and I read something about Muhammad Ali, and he talked about saying, uh, don't quit, suffer now, and you'll be the champion the rest of your life. Um, so, so, so you, 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 and then the best part about this country is it gives you the infrastructure to get to the next level. And with that, um, I know I've taken probably 45 minutes of your time, so I will give it to you guys. And uh, please ask questions about what we do. I, I would love to answer that. So let's go. Actually, one thing I was going to say is you have to be careful saying anything about you know bulls versus calves or. You know, we had five million. We, we we had five million people show up at the rally. We could just keep them going and take over. <laughs> we have one point eight. <laughs> you know, the good thing about where we come from, I know, we don't fight over teams because we have none. <laughs> what we have, panels and mountains. And the only thing I think we have is the Boise State and the blue turf. And we love it. And Utah Jazz is as close as I can get to basketball. But before I tell you a story, I'll talk, I'll talk about Nuck. I don't know anything about these kind of games. I play poker. I mean, that's <laughs> um, you know, <clears throat> I was sitting uh, in Vegas um, uh, a few, few months ago, maybe a few years ago, a year ago maybe. And sitting on the table, and uh, it was the summer league time, where all the basketball players were there. And tall guys, and you know, huge guys just keep showing up, and people keep screaming, oh, this is this guy, this is this guy. Some new dude from Russia just got signed by one of those <coughs> teams. That's right. He was he right. had a beard. I snapped with him. I, he left, by the way. Oh, he left. Okay. He was only seven foot six. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I was gambling with him. And um, and he got up and gave me his phone number and said, oh, I would love to party. I was like, yeah, sure, sure. And he leaves. And this old dude, haggard looking, comes down and sits down. I said, dude, you missed the basketball player. I mean, to me, it doesn't matter, but I'm sure you like it. He goes, I hang out with basketball players all day long. I said, Okay, what do you do? Like Sonny. I had to ask him. <laughs> what do you do? Let me mention that. Not who you are. <laughs> so I had to get the memo. I'm too Pakistani and too Karachi to ever change. I, I saw you in the public. There's a reason why you didn't call us in a Jeep public. But um, I. I, I said, who, 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 what do you do? He goes, oh, I'm the president of a team. I said, what team? And uh, it was uh, Golden State Warriors. Oh, and he said, really? Where is it? <laughs> <laughs> and the guy was so happy to meet somebody who didn't know who Golden State was. <laughs> so I <laughs> played with him all night long, and we gambled, we hung out. Um, and then he gave me his number. He said, you know, if you ever come down, uh, you know, we'll hang out. I'm like, okay. So I got home and my eight-year-old boy, Yusuf, um, Yusuf goes, what did you do? I said, I met some guy from Golden State Warrior. He starts screaming, he goes, what? <laughs> did you ask him for uh, Curry's autograph. autograph? And I said, no, who's Curry? Who's Curry? <laughs> <laughs> and then we eat that shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Yusuf asked me, could you text that guy and ask him for Curry's autograph? So I called him on. And the uh, day before yesterday was Yusuf's birthday, and Yusuf got a signed jersey from Steph Curry. Oh, wow. uh, so, so chances, luck, stories, um, sometimes not knowing helps. So we're telling you our story, and I'm the younger brother, actually, and it's obvious. Because um, <laughs> I don't dye my hair. <laughs> 
Well, he doesn't, but... You know, when I grow my beard, uh, for all those Pakistanis, my father-in-law uh, would say, Choti masjid ka molbi lagta hai. You look like you're a leader of a small mosque. <laughs> when I grow my beard. But uh, our story starts a long time ago. Um, we are, for those of you here, Fahim and I are from the second innings of our father in terminology. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we are uh, the younger wife's kids. And my father uh, was a colonel in the army. A fabulous person. Um, you brought him up today. That's why he's fresh in my memory. And I, you brought tears to my eyes. Um, <clears throat> but when I was born, my father was 50 years old. So he never raised Fahim and I like children. He waited for us to get to a certain stage and then just realized us like friends. That gave us, and I, I'm, I want to tell you the story because it's very important because we're all, some of us are raising grandchildren, some of us are going to be raising kids. I want you to know this. <clears throat> he empowered us to be who we are. He did not force anything. Honest. When I start singing, I'm a pretty damn good singer, actually. Uh, music channel charts. Anybody remembers music channel charts? Yeah. Yeah. I was on music channel charts. I beat I be Janoon for three weeks with my song, Ashna, uh, back in 1991. And when I started singing, my father, the atypical father, said, you need to get a teacher. And he got me somebody, and he still complains that he can't sing because he didn't get a teacher. He can't <laughs> sing for his life. <laughs> so he was very, he was very much, you know, involved in this care, <clears throat> in our care. But the person who drove us to the extent of madness was our mom. Our mom. She's still alive, not dead yet. I don't think she will be, but I promise her I'll keep her on a ventilator forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, she was a nurse. And her dream was that her children become doctors. And she would not compromise for that dream. And when it comes to a dream, she always was the biggest dreamer you'll ever meet in life. We had very few resources. We, uh, our house that we got from the military, uh, the property, was right in front of a cess cesspool of, uh, of filth, actually, because it was supposed to be a sporting arena. And it had um, monsoon. Um, monsoon rains uh, gathered in Fahim and I used to play cricket there and my job was to go get the ball. Uh, <laughs> and my mom set the standard that you will become doctors. And when you become doctors, you'll go to a place called Aachan University. And I said, but I'd like to go to Dhaka. He said, no, you will go to Aachan. So Fahim, being the uh, you know, constant in my existence, <laughs> got into Alpha. And this is how my mother was. I spoke very well, and I got into uh, into uh, Dao, but she said, if you do not go to Alpha, I will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to understand, my father was from Hyderabad, Khatti Dama Khane Wala. And my mother is a Pathan. <laughs> my father used to uh, say that often. We used to say that often. Maybe be <laughs> <laughs> And we got our sense of humor from our father, but we got our aggressiveness from our mother. We, we are who we are because of our Khan University to a great extent. It, an institution makes you who you are. And I'm giving you the background story because I'll let Fahim talk about this as we get to. Fahim, to, Fahim and I, and mother expecting us to do the best, asked us to go to America, become the specialist who we are. And then our journey begins from that point onwards. Till then, we were on the road, on a path that is uh, everybody else is. And then it diverges. It diverges by one lucky coincidence. Fahim takes a job in Florida, calls me up and goes, I will get you the best job in the world. You and I will be rich. We'll make $120,000. We'll have a beautiful house or a condo, whatever we can afford in Florida on the, uh, on the beach. And <clears throat> I tell him, but there's two of us. Why do we have to go work for somebody? And I'm right out of fellowship. And, and not even finish my fellowship. 
And I'm telling this to the younger crowd more than anybody else, because when you're stupid, when you know you know nothing, but you think you know everything, that's the time to take chances. You have nothing to lose. When you get a payroll of fifty thousand or whatever, then you become comfortable. You know, you have everything for you. Know, yes. Um, <clears throat> I chose to say no to him. He had the contract ready, and I met this gentleman out of nowhere. Again, luck, same. Who? Whose name was Mark Caputo. Mark Caputo and we met, and I met, and uh, he said, I have five dollars as humans, and I'll set you up whatever you'd like to go. And I said, okay. We shook hands. I told him I'm not coming. Quit your job. You're going to go join me. And the story begins. <clears throat> well, I was going to do an introduction like uh, earlier Uncle Tate said that my mother's from Pakistan and Neem's father's from Hyderabad, India. <laughs> <laughs> that would have confused a lot of people. <laughs> so I'm glad you give the background. Um, well, there's there's a lot to the story, but long story short, we decided to make uh, a change. Uh, I was comfortably numb in Florida. He's always the guy who comes up with the idea, then I have to execute on the idea, so I take the burden of that. I went and met this guy, and we we, heard, we are not uh, technology people. We were never in Silicon Valley. We were young kids from Karachi who were landed at New York went through their ways, uh, always looking for the next McDonald for the halal fish burger, which was long story short, now we're gambling in Las Vegas for all <laughs> <laughs> so, so, come on, wait. That's what I used to tell them, fish, but she wanted to hear that halal part. <laughs> She was never comfortable. So, but anyway, so we heard a lot of interesting terms today. One was market disruption. So when Mark came to us, the idea was the doctors and, and business guys are always fighting each other. You got to come up with, with some kind of a model where both are happy. He said, I got a model where I'm going to bring you guys in, teach you about medicine, the U.S. works, and, and that was the selling point for us. Um, I was young, married, one child, he was just getting married, I don't know who gave him the daughter, but he did, you know, he ended up one one, apparently my sister-in-law. So we both decided to take the jump. So we decided to move from where I was in Florida, and he was in New York, we both did, uh, went to New York Medical College and ended up in a small town, Pocatello, Idaho. And the reason we went there was because we had a model of market disruption. There was nobody providing the service for kidney care and transplants and dialysis in all of Eastern Idaho. Good, you know, millions of people needed the help. So we established those centers. In two years, we were very successful. So we always have, you know, growing up in Karachi, you have street smartness. I, I was sitting with my, my daughter who goes to Stanford school, and it's like, it's okay to be book smart and, and you're working hard, but I would rather have you more street smart and because you will go places if you have that. So coming from their Karachi background, we was like, you know, we gotta be street smart. We went back to the, the guy and said, yeah, I'm happy with what you've offered me, but I think we've learned the ropes. We're gonna turn this into a franchise. We're gonna build our own analysis clinics. We're gonna bring in the doctors. We bring the machinery. We do it. And that was a very alien subject at that time, back in the early, uh, early time when we started. So we built the first couple of analysis clinics. We built then exponentially 30, 40 of them. Mark went back and expanded another 300 of those, and then we sold to Fresenius for a couple of billion dollars. And we were not technology people. So I know you guys are comfortable for that, for doctors to do something like that. It's kind of totally <laughs> off. They are not business people. They're the worst business guys ever. We did that market disruption. We went to another market disruption, because I want to talk to you about the business side of things. And we went to the cardiovascular um, diseases. We did that, we sold that company again, and now we are, what we are doing is we are engaging in cardiology and nephrology in a whole different platform. And someone mentioned again earlier, which is a very catchy word right now in healthcare, which is care coordination. Care coordination is the future of healthcare, and how you bring those interfaces with peers, providers, and customers, and, and wrap everything together. But that's good, They're all good, all good and, and fine. But what I would really talk about is, uh, and I think, Zan, you mentioned this, or somebody mentioned this, the, or somebody did the art of living. And that's what really changed me seven years ago. And I had a brief discussion this last night with a group of friends, and, and I mentioned a guy named Jeffrey Chaucer. So he's a father of English literature, and he once wrote, hundreds of years ago before you know um, I was born, like I said last night, life being so short, why does it take so long for us to learn the art of living? So 
It just depends on what you define success as. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing, you have a lot of money in the bank, and you're successful, you're running a company, you're closing an IPO, that's all fine. Success is beyond that. If you truly understand that you're only going to get one chance at life to do something, and every morning you wake up your eyes, you have a last chance maybe to do something different, and imagine what that means to you, what that time means to you. So for me, the art of living truly is giving. And it's beyond money, it's about your time, your idea, your engagement. You know, writing a check is one thing, but getting engaged and making a difference around you will be the big thing. So I always will ask you guys, every morning you wake up and ask yourself, what truly success means to you? Yeah, it's great we're doing business and all that, but we have to give back and we have to get engaged, whether we do it with our time, our efforts, our ideas, and that's a bigger picture. Going back to the community thing, stay relevant. Not only in your own communities, but beyond that. You know, drop all the labels, like somebody else said. I mean, I was sitting with my daughter again, because I have two daughters and I, and four girls get a lot from their Pakistani father from Karachi. So I keep telling them, drop all the labels. Drop the label of religion, nationality, color, identity, everything, and wear the lens of humanity. And when you look through those lenses, everybody will look the same to you. And no matter who becomes the president, whether it's Trump or Hillary, they'll never be able to break your mold, because you will connect with people. And that is what the future of our society is. That's how we re become re relevant. But anyway, that's why I wanted to stop. to jump in, I think these guys can continue and, you know, they have great, but, but coming back to actually a few questions, and by the way, this time check, we've got 15 more minutes? Actually, we have a bit of a crunch, so we're not going to be able to give you about five minutes. <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> that, that, so in, in, in Zan's terminology, that's 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> So, so one, one question today for you is, and similar one to you guys, I mean, your businesses are, you know, to me they seem kind of not related, right? So pallet business to hotel business to Verizon, you know, retail outlets. Why did you do that? I mean, why are you, you know, and, and what why, are, why are we diversifying? Yeah, okay. great question. Um, so let, let me say a couple of things about our main focus business. So we have seven divisions. Four of our businesses serve the same customer base. So all the big box stores, you name it. Um, after the Kmart uh, life, we got into the Walmarts, fortunately. And we grew with Home Depot's and you name it, everybody. And what they do is, is if you think about as a consumer, all the products when they're delivered at Walmart, and they're delivered at Home Depot or any grocery stores like Kroger. As a consumer, once it's done, what they have us do it is, is, is a sustainability effort that between their distribution centers and their stores, we've got our facilities between that. So they are very smart about not running logistically any empty miles. What that means is, is that when a consumer buys some product, then they drop what they call dunnage, which are empty boxes, uh, empty dunnage with pallets, which we manufacture, we manufacture millions of them, is what's dropped at our place. And then from that moment on, we manage all that dunnage. Now consumers are changing. Um, we have a customer Best Buy, everybody knows. So when you order as a consumer, an uh, iPad, so if you live uh, around this area, it used to be that it would come from their distribution center. Now it comes from a local store next to you because they want to move their inventory and they want to be uh, cutting their freight part of their business. So the world is changing. Uh, I talked about the young talent. They are the next consumer, if you will, because we are kind of outdated. You know, I, I mean, we're, we're the, the ERP systems and the new technology which is coming. Everything is uh, online right now. We just acquired an apartment here locally. And my wife ordered eight boxes from Amazon. So when you talk about Amazon, nobody wants to compete with Amazon because they're losing money, but really Walmart and everybody has to compete with them because they've got that infrastructure, but they have no choice but to compete with them. So to answer your question, most of our, of our customer base as a consumer is the same. So we have diversified our growth. 
other than our investment portfolios of Hilton's and Marriott's or whatever you might call it. But our customer base between the packaging companies, so I'll give you one more fact because I know we're limited with time, Aris. But so, so you know, we, we are building, um, by the way, somebody said 250 million, we're building a $500 million worth of storage places in the United States in about 40 different states. We have 19 of them so far. We, we stay humble, but the reason I wanted to kind of share with you because American culture, you have to learn where the opportunity is, just like you learned in uh, Idaho. Americans don't throw away their junk. When they get divorced, they store. Okay, so and that's that's a norm, right? We don't get divorced, even if I might see You know, I'm allowed for marriages. You know, but, Anyway, more on a serious note. Um, but, but I also want to say something, well, uh, right quick, I, guys, sorry about the time. Um, you know, you said something very interesting about the money, you know? I learned from a Jew, uh, a Jewish family. Yes. You have to make a million dollar for the other party before you make your million. And down to earth, uh, I, I never imagined we would hit a billion dollar in sales, and you know, I grew up with them, by the way. We, we could never imagine, because the system allows you to do that, but you have to make money, and you have to develop leaders around you yes. if you want to be successful. But coming back to it, this is about the storage industry, you have to understand what you're dealing with. So you innovate. Innovation is everything in our business today. So innovation, without innovation, we don't exist. If I sold kebabs, because that was an idea, that was innovation. We sold crates for MTD, and we they can collapse them, so they can get it back to the distribution center, so they don't have to throw that wood away, it's sustainability, it's innovation. So everything, you have to keep up. You have to be two steps ahead. So anybody as a young talent starting out in business, and the only difference between you and I as young talent, whoever is here, is time. The only difference is time. We're just 20 years older, even though I'm 21, like you said, <laughs> said which we, nobody believed, by the way. But coming back to it, is innovation is everything. So storage industry, so once we learned it, we know there's a niche. Any business you do, find a niche. Be, uh, we built most of our businesses are commodity businesses, but we excel in it because we find a way as a one-stop shop. So we serve the same customer with more than one service. So all my companies are serving the same consumer. Hopefully that answers that question. I, I, I want to give um, to uh, Corby a break, but because I went to the public and then Adam too. <laughs> so ha it took me about two years to learn a PL statement. <laughs> uh, and for those of you who don't know it, one day you will need it. Yeah. <laughs> um, the reason we would diversify is because we have time to think. Save some time for yourself. If I have to give you one advice, don't get so busy in the world that you don't have time to think. Every single doctor is a freaking genius. We're no different. They're smart. <laughs> They're all smart. Every single human being is very smart. The only problem is the rut in the system drives you down, puts you into that mode we don't expect you to say, to think. We have time to think, and that's what we do. Hence, we never brought this up. One of the ideas that I came up with, being very humble. <laughs> um, Not your brother, right? No, no, no. I try to do it. He's running the company, actually. There we go. Is if, if, listen, you live in Idaho, you eat potatoes. You live in Idaho, you go ski. So imagine a 31 year old showing up on the ski hill with his two year old child, and then, well, uh, we're both on the bunny hill. We learned to ski, but you know what we did? I came up with the idea, first of its kind, fully automated, smart kiosk calls, ski, ski quickie, to wax, ski, and snowboards in the world. Patented all across the world. And starting that company has nothing to do with medicine. It has everything to do with having time to think, looking around, finding an opportunity. We're all hustlers, who are all of us here. 
So the concluding comment from the guy who actually has to exit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, having time is also a good thing, and a little bit of weed also helps in things. <laughs> Stay true to yourself. One of the one of the things which is part of our inherent culture when we live in that country with a very homogenous environment around us, we get used to always meeting others and asking, what can I get from that person? What he can do for me? Stop that thought process. Start thinking, what can I do? What I can bring to the table? What I can do for that person or that environment or that community? And you'll see the world will change around you. You will benefit regardless, but you're not part of a bigger picture. So thank you. Thanks for having me.